Captain Midnight. This video is brought to you by Adam and Eve. Use the link in the description and code MIDNIGHT to get 50% off one item plus free shipping in the US and Canada. A little over a month ago, I released a video about sitcoms and aspect ratios, where I included a clip from the Always Sunny podcast. In the clip, co-creator Charlie Day talks about how he was really reluctant to move the show to HD and the 16x9 aspect ratio, and move away from 4.3 just because he thought it suited the show so well. People really responded to that video, and I got a lot of comments about It's Always Sunny. Which definitely got me thinking about it, and specifically how well it leans into the strengths of its medium, in a way that so many TV shows in the streaming era never really have a chance to. So that's what I really wanted to go over this week. Why I think It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia represents so much of what television can do and be at its best. We're going to Mars. Uh-huh. Have a good time. <laughs> If you're watching this video, you may know the basic gist of the show's origins. A group of friends filmed some comedic short films, inspired by the cringe comedy of the original UK Office and Larry David's Curb Your Enthusiasm. Those shorts were later expanded and rewritten, turned into a very small scale and cheap looking television pilot about a group of selfish unemployed actors called It's Always Sunny on TV. It attracted the attention of Fox's cable channel, FX, which had just made a major push into original programming with dramas like The Shield and Nip Tuck. FX loved the pilot and found the extremely low budget especially appealing, but they didn't want it to be a show about the industry or LA, so creators Rob McElhenney, Charlie Day, and Glenn Howerton agreed to relocate the show to Philly, McElhenney's hometown. Considering how little experience any of them had at running the show, which is basically none, that's a pretty incredible origin story for what is now the longest running live action sitcom. But I think it's what you see throughout those early seasons where it gets really interesting. You get a chance to watch the show locate the strengths of its actors and characters, to take the pretty basic and low budget framework of that first episode and mold it into something much more unique. This isn't to say that season 1 is bad, it's far from the show at its best but it's still filled with great moments, even if many of the episodes as a whole don't really hang together that well. For the most part, the characters just aren't fully formed yet. You see this in all of them, but I think the most obvious example is probably Sweet D. D was easily the most underwritten character early on, functioning as a kind of generic foil to the guys and often the voice of reason. And if this small batch of episodes were all that existed, that would forever remain what that character was defined by. Thankfully, that didn't happen. The show discovered just how amazing Caitlin Olsen is at comedy, especially physical comedy, and brought out the best possible version of that character. It's really that spontaneity and that sense of discovery that can make seasons of television feel so exciting to me. You get to see shows responding to what's working and what isn't week by week. And It's Always Sunny exemplifies that really well. The show that it became has a lot in common with season one. Obviously, it's about a group of selfish idiots who own a bar. But so much of what makes Sunny Sunny, what gives it that specific texture of its own, was found over time. It wasn't some master plan executed with precision. It grew out of conversations between talented writers and performers, sometimes literally on the spot as they were shooting. A major character detail, like Charlie being illiterate, was decided while filming a scene in Season 2's The Gang Goes Jihad. It was just Charlie Day having a strong feeling that Charlie Kelly not being able to read the note was the best thing for the scene, and having to talk the other showrunners into it. Jump forward more than a decade, and it's hard to imagine the character of Charlie Kelly without that. The same goes for Max's sexuality, or Dennis's whole thing. Tools! Tools! This is a duct tape, zip ties, and gloves! I have to have my tools! Watching a scripted show, especially a good show with a pretty limited budget and a tight shooting schedule, is like watching someone lay down train tracks while the train is only a mile or two behind them. I think that's something that really attracts me to both TV and monthly comics. The sense that, at any moment, this whole thing could kind of go off the rails. Now does that lead to, like, absolute perfection? Basically never. I'm sure there's plenty of episodes, scenes, and lines that the Always Sunny guys would like another shot at, 
maybe inconsistencies that bug them, and things that they feel like have aged poorly. Movies have that too, but TV is shooting a lot more scenes with a lot less, at least when compared to most studio films. There's bound to be entire episodes, sometimes even entire seasons, that don't really work. Filmmakers can create something beautiful and then be able to walk away from it. Let's go with an easy classic pick like Casablanca, just this brilliantly paced and incredibly well-directed film, basically the 1940s Hollywood studio system firing on all cylinders to deliver us an immaculate hour and 42 minutes of near perfection. Television isn't that. TV is messy and sprawling, a long-term creative endeavor where the showrunners have to contend with both a numbers-obsessed network or streaming service and whatever else can go wrong on a long-running show. Now obviously plenty of things can go wrong during the shoot of a film too, but with long-running TV shows, it's pretty much guaranteed that something is going to force the show to adapt to circumstances outside of the showrunner's control in major, story-specific ways. Whether it's the actor who played Mr. Echo in Lost deciding that he just doesn't want to live in Hawaii where they shot the show, or two of the lead actors in CBS's The Good Wife insisting that they can't be in the same room with each other for any scenes, despite the fact that that's usually a requirement to play best friends. Something weird and unexpected is just going to happen. It's almost built into the way that TV is made, which means it's not a medium that lends itself to flawless storytelling, but it does give us the opportunity to see shows deal with these changes as they happen. And maybe this is just me, but watching a show handle those moments well and maybe even come out stronger on the other side is one of the things I like most about TV. Always Sunny definitely had a moment like that, I mean, they literally had FX tell them that the show would be cancelled unless they added a big name actor to the cast to attract some buzz. The showrunners, especially Charlie Day apparently, initially hated the idea. Which makes sense, it could have derailed the chemistry of the entire show. Instead, they were able to make it work in a way that didn't feel like it violated the spirit of the show. More than that, they gave us Frank Reynolds, one of the best sitcom characters ever. And another character that really had to grow into his own, as Danny DeVito pushed his performance farther and farther into the grotesque, and the guys learned how to best write to that choice. Of course, so far I've mostly talked about how the cast of Always Sunny kind of found those characters over time, which is an opportunity that shows have in their early seasons. Unless they're snuffed out after just a few episodes, which, you know, does happen a lot now. But I think we also should talk about the problems and opportunities of an aging show. And It's Always Sunny has had to contend with those for years. There's that old TV tropes term, flanderization, meaning, and I'll just quote the Wikipedia here, the process through which a single element of a character's personality, often an originally mild element, is inflated in importance over the course of work until it becomes their primary defining characteristic. Think Joey getting increasingly dumber on Friends, or obviously Ned Flanders on The Simpsons becoming more and more obsessed with religion as the seasons went on. It's Always Sunny almost feels immune to that criticism because of the nature of these characters. They're not Joey or Chandler Bing, who we're expected to believe can like function as average adults with jobs. The Patty's pub crew doesn't need to grow or change. Becoming cartoonishly one-dimensional can suit them at times, though the writers usually do a great job of finding new angles to tackle the same few traits. Does Dennis get weirder and more obsessive as the show goes on? Definitely, but it almost always works because the characters acting more and more ridiculous to the point where they come off like lunatics to anyone not inside their little bubble just doesn't feel forced at all. If anything, It's Always Sunny is a show about watching the gang succumb to all their worst impulses over and over again, and taking those ridiculous traits to the next level. This is all related to another common issue with older sitcoms, the ages of the actors changing over time. In a show like The Office, the lives of Jim and Pam can kind of feel artificially stagnant, with the show often bending over backwards to maintain the same basic setup, while also trying to have their characters progress and change. If New Girl was still on now, and all those characters still shared an apartment doing the same sitcom hijinks in their mid to late 40s, it would probably come off as a little sad. It's Always Sunny just does not have that problem. 
The fact that they all keep behaving this way as they get older and older every season fits perfectly with the tone of the show and its characters. Like, if these characters are still alive in 10 years, it's hard to picture them being anywhere else but Patty's, hanging out with the only other people who can stand to be around them. It's pretty grim, and it's also the perfect recipe for an extremely long-running series. Everything about It's Always Sunny, from its deep bench of supporting characters, its constant experimentation with different one-off episode concepts, to the fact that most of the show can basically be boiled down to a few people talking in a dingy bar set, is just extremely television. It's imperfect, it may take a little while to hit its stride, but when it clicks, and when the actors, the writers, and the audience know these characters like they're old friends, but they still somehow manage to surprise us, I think there's really nothing else like it. Here's a special tip for the fellas and girls who have not already joined Captain Midnight's new 1940 flight patrol. You'd better hurry up and join at once because there's a big adventure ahead. The thing to do now is to get started because we're going to have not only barrels of fun, but loads of free gifts and prizes too.